Okay, thank you, introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, having me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk a bit uh, about the methods that I'm working on in my group. And I'm hoping that I will be able to demonstrate a little bit how they can be actually useful maybe for some of the studies uh, in TACO. I understand these are com extremely complex materials and simulations are very hard to achieve uh, for these very complex materials problems. Even with DFT, I think uh, it's a, a real challenge and maybe with machine learning one can tackle many of these problems. So um, in general, when you do any type of ab initio simulation, you want to be able to have a good control uh, of the error and you want to have ideally uh, an estimate of the error your prediction has and you want to be able to uh, systematically uh, reduce this error. And if you look at what's the, the current state of the art in this uh, field of ab initio simulations, and uh, it's clear that the by far most widely and most successful method is density functional theory in the framework of approximate exchange and correlation energy functionals. It's due to this really, uh, really beneficial trade-off between accuracy and cost. And as I've said in the beginning, you want to be able to kind of systematically improve upon the accuracy that uh, your predictions uh, have. And as, uh, as described nicely uh, by John Pertieu in uh, the field of density functional theory calculations, you can envisage the different approximations in sort of a Jacobs ladder. Now what this Jacobs ladder tries to illustrate is that as you build on uh, more and more sophisticated density functionals that you use to, uh, to predict the exchange and correlation energy of a system, uh, you're hoping by putting more and more information into your exchange and correlation functional to achieve higher and higher accuracy. So if uh, this was uh, in principle, this is of course a nice idea and on average, if you study many, many systems, you will find that on average this will also hold. So as you go from an LDA to a GGA and to a meta GGA functional, you will observe this improvement. Unfortunately, this ladder is not always straight for some systems, actually it also can go down. And uh, this is uh, one of the main issues one has to try to, uh, to overcome. So, uh, this is then mostly uh, observed in practice and tried to circumvent by different types of parametrizations. So there is all of these parametrizations, as you go to higher ranks on this ladder, become more and more uh, complicated and often there is not a unique choice to the parametrization of the exchange and correlation energy density functional. So this has led to the introduction of many different uh, exchange and correlation energy functionals some of which really perform uh, extremely well for many properties and are therefore becoming more and more widely used. But this is not a guarantee that for every system, every prediction you make becomes better as you increase upon these ranks. So uh, moreover, there are some intrinsic problems uh, that one has to be careful about. And uh, just to mention a few, there is the self-interaction error problem in DFT calculations that is in practice often used, cured by introducing uh, a self-interaction correction parameter which is uh, termed uh, a U, and often the question arises, how large is the self-interaction error in a particular system? And often uh, an ab initio prediction then turns into a modeling of a certain system by tuning this parameter U to a specific experimental property. So a lot of these questions have to be kind of addressed, and <coughs> uh, there is an uh, alternative set of methods that I want to, uh, that I want to uh, focus on in my presentation today, and this has already been alluded to by a couple of other talks. Uh, this set of methods that also aims at improving the, uh, an ab initio prediction is in a systematic manner is built on a more traditional answer of quantum mechanics. It's actually just built on many electron perturbation theory. By starting from any mean field approximation, yeah, which is then considered to be the zero order description of the system, one builds on top of this mean field description more and more sophisticated many electron perturbed wave function predictions, uh, descriptions of the system. This only comes at the extremely high price of increasing the computational complexity with respect to the system size. And as you can see, a very, uh, well, uh, a, a, a method that is considered fairly accurate, which is called this couple cluster plus single stars plus perturbative triples method, which is just a perturbation theory method that is to some order an effectively renormalized couple cluster perturbation theory and adds on a fourth order perturbation theory term, uh, which is then um, uh, uh, acronymed with by this parenthesis T term. And this method 
uh, has an extremely expensive computational complexity with respect to the system size n. So the number of floating point operations you have to carry out on a, in an Apinizio simulation scales with the seventh power of a measure of the system size, so the number of electrons. And this is the main reason why these methods are really uh, only useful uh, in most cases for simulations of small systems, but they have a very highly controllable uh, level of, uh, of, of, of error. And then, therefore, they can be used by maybe studying smaller systems or mo smaller model systems. They can be used to benchmark the more computationally efficient uh, methods and maybe tell you for simulation, which functional should I use, which, uh, which interaction correction term you should I use, how should I treat dispersion interactions by which approximations. And this is uh, the topic of my talk today. I will mo mainly talk about how uh, kind of we have been working on, on this uh, uh, qu traditional quantum chemistry many electron theories in the past few years and what we are currently capable of, of studying and how, how this can be compared and maybe be combined uh, eventually with density functional theory. And of course, ideally uh, in a perfect world, at some point we are able to combine all of these methods with machine learning and then uh, really be able to, to simulate uh, much more complex and sophisticated systems so that they can be really useful for experimentalists. How can we reduce the computational complexity in these methods without a loss of inaccuracy? And uh, I just wanna briefly mention that there are lots of, lots of, there's been a lot of advancements yeah, in, the, in the last couple of years and decades by the field of uh, the quantum chemists. They have introduced very uh, clever approximations to kind of uh, increase applicability, expand the scope of these approaches. And I'm also quite optimistic that many of these approaches, yeah, if properly adjusted, can also be applied to solids. So I will not be talking so much about the methodological developments itself, uh, themselves, but rather about the applications that we have uh, used these quantum chemical methods in the past few years to demonstrate uh, what, what, what we can currently study. In particular, I want to focus on three topics. The first one will be pressure temperature phase diagrams of solids. This is, uh, I think, a very nice set of uh, applications because it demonstrates nicely where does the Jacobs ladder of DFT suffer from which problems and how can these more sophisticated many electron theories be used uh, to, uh, to improve the, the level of accuracy. In particular, I also want to talk a little bit about the high pressure phases of hydrogen. This is just one of these systems that after you have worked with these many electron theories, you kind of start thinking, well, this is the hammer. Now you find the perfect nail, which is the set of problem that you want to study with this, with this couple cluster theories, because it's just uh, 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 maybe not that relevant for the TACO uh, project itself, but I think it illustrates nicely where the strengths of these methods are. I want to talk a little bit about ground and excited states of defects in solids. So the advantage of these many electron methods lie also in the fact that they are not necessarily restricted to the study of electronic ground states, but they can also be applied to study excited states. And as many of the potential applications of complex oxides lie, for instance, in uh, photocatalytic uh, materials, I guess it's very important uh, also to have a, a set of methods that can, can treat uh, electronically excited states. And finally, I want to talk about uh, molecular absorption studies on surfaces, which we have carried out, but of course, which are uh, in terms of complexity, not, uh, not, uh, not, not, not yet at the stage where we can really study such complex systems uh, like the, the, the magnetite. However, I will show you how some recent work uh, at least promises to be able to, to treat these systems in the future. So let's start with pressure temperature phase diagrams of solids. And uh, to, <coughs> to get started, I want to show you this simple, really simple textbook example of condensed matter physics. Uh, we want to be able to predict uh, the relative uh, phase stability of two, uh, of a high density and a low density phase. In one case, it could be, for instance, the carbon diamond phase versus the carbon graphitic phase. And in the other system that I want to discuss, boron nitride, it would be the zinc plant phase of boron nitride versus the hexagonal boron nitride phase uh, in, this, in this graphitic phase. So it's a very simple question to ask which of these two phases is thermodynamically more stable. Actually, we know that from experiment, they are even close to be degenerate. They are close to degeneracy uh, at, uh, at, at ambient conditions. So uh, this means that if I look at that energy difference per atom of these two phases, in the on the left-hand side for the carbon allotrop and on the right-hand side for the boron nitride allotrop, what I expect is a result which is very close to zero. 
the gray bars always refer to experimental results. In the case of carbon, it's clear that there is only an undisputed experimental result uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this energy difference, which indicates a slightly positive number at around plus 20 millielectron volts per atom that says graphite is the more stable uh, allotrope of carbon. Now let's look at what the Jacobs letter of DFT tells us about the, uh, the thermodynamic stability of these two phases. Well, if you look at the lowest rank, LDA slightly favors the high density phase, uh, diamond. Then you climb up that ladder and you go to the generalized gradient approximation result, which is often used in, in, in the framework of P the PV functional. And you see that there is a strong over stabilization of the graphitic phase. And then you can ask yourself the question, which one is more important? Should I climb up the Jacobs ladder more, going to a meta GGA, or should I rather account for dispersion interactions in the system, which are also known to be very important? And what you find then is that if you add on the dispersion correction uh, on the level of uh, many body dispersion as introduced by Chichenko, you will see that, okay, there is a certain level of stabilization of the more densely dense phase, yeah, which kind of brings the relative stability closer to experiment. But then the question is, well, should I add this also to the meta GGA result? Because if I add the same dispersion level to the meta GGA result, I would again kind of get a too, too strong stabilization of the high density phase. So I'm just saying that unfortunately in this case, it's very difficult to go beyond a certain level of, of accuracy in these predictions. Yeah? If you know the right answer, it's of course easy and you can always argue which contributions are more important. But if you don't know the right answer from these results, that increase uh, with, with this level of exchange and correlation energy approximations is difficult to tell which one is the right answer. These are the results that we get for the, uh, for the, for the quantum chemical many electron theories. Alfred Fox theory would actually even not predict graphite to be the most stable phase, but really just a single graphene layer because it doesn't account for any dispersion interactions. So the zeroth order approximation is really a very bad starting point, much worse than LDA. But then as you move on to MP2 and couple cluster theories, you see that there is at least a kind of a more systematic approach to a result on the level of couple cluster plus perturbative triples, which is mm, not perfect in agreement with experiment, but it's, uh, th th it's clear that uh, th there, there is at least some safety about this result. Yeah? This is quantum Monte Carlo results. They have, uh, yeah, they have achieved an almost perfect agreement with experiment but there are also a certain approximations involved, yeah? And I hardly doubt that any theory currently is able to predict the real exact thermodynamic relative stability with plus minus 10 to 20 meter electron volts errors because there are also pseudo-potential errors involved, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is not, it's not simply easy to address. For the case of boron nitride, the situation is more interesting because there are different experimental results for the different stability of the high and low density phases. There is a very old result by Solochenko that has predicted the high density phase to be more stable versus the low density phase. And it uh, turns out that a lot of LDA calculations that have been performed in the 90s have uh, been in very good agreement with this initial result by Solochenko in the 90s. But then as you move on to more uh, uh, the GGA and dispersion corrected functionals, it again points to something which, which makes chemically more sense, namely that these two phases are, should be very similarly degenerate as for the case of carbon. These are both covalently bound systems with very similar chemistry. So why should in this case one phase be much more stable than for the carbon phase? So uh, nicely, initially actually I was quite worried because I thought that our couple cluster results are all wrong. And I kind of tried to make um, my postdoc Thomas Gruber back in Stuttgart really work hard and converge to this result. But he couldn't actually converge to this result but he always converged to this result. And then I was quite fortunate that I realized other and more recent papers that are in contradiction with the, all the experimental results. And this, I think, makes a slightly a difference if you make a prediction, yeah, if you have a predictive method versus if you have a modeling method where you have so many adjustable parameters that uh, you try to work much harder always to get to, to reproduce the experimental result. But if you fail, you maybe really have found a reason why, why you can't reproduce experiment. And this is uh, at least in this uh, case, it was very encouraging in the end, although it was uh, difficult work uh, to get done during the project. So I want to move on to a different topic. And uh, what I didn't say in the beginning was that couple cluster singles and doubles theory is a perturbation theory based on Hartree-Fock methods. And it has uh, essentially two important properties. One's, one, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's exact to third order in perturbation theory. So it contains all third order perturbation theory diagrams. And second important feature of CCSD theories is that it's a theory that is exact for any two electron system. If you have a theory that is exact for any two electron system, of course, 
you can perfectly ac exactly describe the dissociation of a single hydrogen molecule. Moreover, CCSD also accounts for interactions between pairs of electrons only in an approximate manner. And this means that if you have weakly interacting electron pairs, like weakly interacting hydrogen molecules, you may assume that CCSD should in fact be able to predict a fairly accurate result for these type of systems for their electronic grounded energy. And therefore I thought, well, it should, we should really look at so the solid hydrogen phases because these are the kind of systems where CCSD theory should be expected to, be, to yield very accurate results. Unfortunately, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the rich phase diagram in pressure and temperature space of solid hydrogen, you will find that there is a lot of uh, complicated physics going on. So uh, simply studying uh, a molecular or atomic solid is only really uh, uh, realistic in the very low temperature regime. In the high temperature regime, you, you actually have uh, super molecular liquids, etc., and you need to include much more physics than just the electronic correlation uh, in a type of von Oppenheimer approximation. So we only were restricted, we are restricting ourselves to study the low temperature but high pressure phases of solid hydrogen. And we asked ourselves, can we use Kapokasta theory to predict the metallization pressure, uh, or at least tell something about the metallization pressure, and can we say at least something about uh, which of these uh, molecular solid phases, which are only just candidate structures yeah, for the different molecular orientationally ordered crystals, uh, which ones are the most stable ones in, uh, in CCSD theory. So similar to the studies before, uh, we could simply take a set of candidate structures and compare their thermodynamic stability as a function of pressure. And this was already, a lot of this work was already done by Quantum Monte Carlo people beforehand because they have identified uh, a lot of uh, candidate structures based on DFT calculations and then using these DFT candidate structures they have uh, carried out more expensive Quantum Monte Carlo calculations. So uh, why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because at the moment, uh, so well, basically since the last uh, 110 years or so, uh, the predicted metallization pressure of solid hydrogen has grown from the first prediction by Wigner and Huntington at uh, 25 gigapascals to, uh, to nowadays which where it is predicted to lie between 425 and 450 gigapascals. So there was a big evolution in terms of the theoretical prediction of this metallization pressure. And every time a new experiment has been carried out at higher pressures, they were able to kind of confirm that, well, it's not metallic in this pressure range. So theory has to kind of uh, make more accurate predictions. And only recently there are experimental results uh, where one experimental results predict to have observed metallization at around 425 gigapascal and another experimental result is predict has predicted metallization at 450. So in order to understand this uh, band closing of the band gap, you also have to understand the phase. And this is what we did uh, uh, at first. Yeah, we studied the thermodynamic stability of these different uh, molecular crystal phases. They have been predicted or identified as candidate structures many times based on DFT calculations, even though many of these phases, especially this model, this one, the one phase that I will focus on now is this phase three uh, candidate structure. It has this C2C, C2C symmetry with 24 atoms in the unit cell. And for this candidate structure, uh, DFT would not say uh, it's uh, stable at any pressure range. It only becomes stable at a fairly high pressure range. But it is therefore, has therefore been included by a, a DMC study of Neil Drummond before already because it was a likely candidate. Yeah, if the DFT calculation predicts this phase to be much less stable, of course, it would not be such a likely candidate. But this is actually a nice combination of DFT with beyond DFT methods because DFT is used beforehand to select a set of candidates. And then these candidates are screened with a higher level theory. And uh, CCSD theory has then been applied to these candidate structures and compared to the quantum Monte Carlo predictions. And indeed, we have been able to say uh, that uh, all the relative stabilities yeah, that have been predicted by quantum Monte Carlo calculations at a much higher computational cost uh, um, uh, agree with the predicted stabilities we find in CCSD theory. And uh, then what we have done next was we have taken these candidate structures and we have asked ourselves the questions, what about the internal decrease of freedom of these candidate structures? They are all optimized based on some DFT functional. So the bond lengths of the hydrogen, for instance, strongly depend on which functional you choose. And if you check carefully, you see that the shortest bond length in a DFT PBE a hydrogen, solid hydrogen calculation, which is only 0 0.75 angstroms, um, has a, in a DBE band gap calculation, 
has this band gap of 0 0.9 eV. And if you change that bond length yeah, by optimizing the structure on the level of, the, uh, of MP2 theory by, by, by using the MP2 forces and then allowing the internal degrees of freedom to relax with the, uh, on the level of second order perturbation theory, you see that this bond length goes from 0 0.75 angstrom to 0 0.72, so, it, so it, it's shrinking. It has a dramatic influence on the band gap. So it changes the band gap by one electron volt. Uh, shorter bond lengths mean, mean larger band gaps in the solid hydrogen phases. And it means that if you change the band gap by one electron volt, you basically shift, if you had a slope yeah, that tells you what's the band gap as a function of the pressure, if you would shift an experimental slope, for instance, in the terms of, uh, in, uh, in the band gap, by one EV, you would shift uh, the transition pressure where you have predicted the metallization by a significant uh, amount of gigapascals, so roughly something like 20 to 50 gigapascals. So it's, uh, it's really uh, an important uh, ingredient in these simulations to use the right structures. And it's a nice demonstration of the interplay between these different approximations. So uh, of course, it also turns, it's not, 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 not sufficient to calculate these band gaps only with a DFT functional, but you need to go beyond uh, density functional theory calculations. So we have used uh, the GW implementation in VASP, and uh, this will of course increase the band gap. And we have collaborated uh, with Xing Xing Li from Peking University, who has computed the electron phonon uh, interaction contribution, which renormalizes the band gap. It turns out that the renormalization effect is as large uh, on the band gap as this change of the band gap if you use the wrong structure. So First of all, you use the right structure and you find that your band gap increases by one EV. Then you account for the zero point uh, renormalization effects on the band gap. You will find that this reduces the band gap again by one EV. So you could have just used the wrong structure in the beginning and you would have gotten the same, the same answer. But there are two different uh, predictions for the metallization pressure. And the question is also partly what's the reason for this uh, different metallization pressure. And one of the reasons is that uh, they calibrate the measured pressures with the H2 Vibron frequency. And uh, you can also use this methodology then to actually calculate what's the, to ask the question, what's the vibrant frequency of the molecular uh, hydrogen in the crystal? And does it agree with the pressure that they use to calibrate it? And then we can actually find that there is a disagreement between two experiments, yeah, one carried out by Louberry in France and one by uh, Silvera and Diaz in the US. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the pressure calibration that we have found to be the most reliable one is the one by, uh, by, by used by Lobary, which predicts uh, a metallization uh, of, of hydrogen at a larger pressure of around 450 gigapascals. So with this, I want to go quickly through the second part of my talk. And I want to address uh, the question about how can we use this, uh, uh, this, this many electron theories to study defects in solids. I think I'm not having much time left, right? So three minutes. Okay, so I will, uh, I will basically go to this and then I will skip large parts, of, large parts of the talk on the adsorption. We'll only go to the end of the, uh, the recent results of the adsorption studies. These defects in solids are interesting. Uh, if you, uh, uh, for, this, uh, for these excited state calculations using equation of motion couple cluster theory, because <coughs> um, uh, they are an ideal test bed somehow. This, there are not that many applications of excited state couple cluster theory calculation in, in solids. And many times it's very difficult to find reliable, uh, reliable estimates of optical excitation energies for defects in solids. And these F centers that we have studied in earth alkali oxide, including magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, and strontium oxide, are ex studied experimentally very well. And uh, we can use them by building simple model systems uh, using a supercell approach. And so we have done so, and what you find is that uh, in these F centers, you basically lack, uh, um, uh, you, uh, uh, so you lack an oxygen in your crystal. Uh, there's a vacancy there, and it, the, due to the attract part of the Madelung potential in this part of the crystal, two electrons localize at this vacant site. And these ele localized electronic states lie exactly in the band gap of this material. So you have two occupied, uh, you have two electrons occupying a vacancy orbital, and you can simply now ask yourself the question, well, what do the many electron theory predict uh, as the adsorption and emission energy uh, using a couple cluster theory? And what you get is that uh, using these excited state approaches, you can study them really in the full complexity uh, of the multiplet structure. Yeah? So this means that uh, 
even though the singlet ground state here yeah, in the supercell uh, of this, uh, this F-center defect um, is, um, is, um, is basically the ground, so it's basically the ground state configuration of these two electrons in the defect. Um, but uh, it leads also to an overemphasized uh, lattice relaxation around this defect. And uh, now if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at the excited states yeah, of, these, um, uh, of these electronic configurations, you find that the first excited state is actually a triplet state. And, um, um, and then the second excited state is a singlet state. Optically allowed is, of course, only the singlet-singlet transition. And what you find is that in this excited singlet state, the lattice would try to relax in such a way that the atoms move more outwards. And at this point here, there is a crossing between the singlet and triplet. And there is a transition of this singlet, excited singlet state to the excited triplet state that can occur. And then the system will be kind of uh, uh, left in this uh, excited triplet state and photoluminescence has to occur at some point. And both of these events can be measured experiment, absorption and the emission. And we can use uh, this uh, equation of motion couple cluster theories to predict this excitation and emission energies. And it's quite nice actually to, to, to then also compare them to, uh, to the experimental results, but also uh, different um, uh, 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 post-DFT approaches, uh, in particular the GW plus DSE approach. And we can, si we can see that for all of these systems, we get a pretty good agreement for the absorption energy except, uh, and also for the emission energy with the experiment, except for magnesium oxide. And it turns out that for magnesium oxide, the peak that is assigned to this uh, emission has long been a debate yeah, over different processes. And uh, it's most likely not really an emission of the F center in the magnesium oxide, because in this system, magnesium oxide has the shortest bond length, yeah, the shortest lattice constant. And it's, uh, it's difficult actually to, uh, to really say that this, uh, uh, this transition from the excited to the singlet state does really occur. It's much more likely that before it can de-excite uh, it's actually going into a, a charged state due to this excitation. So the last part I want to uh, want to emphasize is very recent work that was carried out by Tobias Schaefer, who is already collaborating uh, with uh, with uh, Gareth Parkinson. And the idea of his uh, project is uh, is which is very promising is that we can also use to, to this uh, couple cluster theories to expand the scope significantly by using an embedding technique. And this is particularly useful for local phenomena such as the study of absorption energies on surfaces. What uh, Tobias has done was that he implemented a, uh, a new framework uh, for localizing the occupied orbitals, and he's used these occupied, uh, localized occupied orbitals to find fragments around the uh, center of interest, like the, molecule, the absorbing molecule. And then he have con has consecutively, uh, uh, um, so he has basically building bigger and bigger fragments and studying the absorption energy only for these bigger and bigger fragments and correcting for the error using a lower level of theory. And this correction on the lower level of theory turns out to be very efficient when you use direct RPA. So he has now been able to even study very complex systems like titanium dioxide uh, surfaces with water absorbed on top. And even if you account for the relaxation effects yeah, of, the, of the surface, you can actually uh, get very good estimates of the absorption energies for the level of, uh, for CCSD when you account for the errors you make using the RPA. And uh, the final result slide I want to show you is that these are very recent results that we are now also able to do CCSD up to the level of parentheses T for such very complex uh, surface problems yeah, uh, by simply defining small enough fragments that still are small enough so that we can use these high level methods. So finally, I apologize for uh, being a bit over my time. And I want to thank uh, all the collaborators and my group members uh, for, for, the, for their work and uh, you for your attention. Thank you very much for your very nice introduction to uh, high level quantum chemistry methods in solid. Are there any questions? May I ask you so you show the results for graphite and you, you claim that the diffusion of Monte Carlo, well, obviously, it's quite good, but. Was this actually, I mean, graphite, first of all, is a metal. And second, uh, did they use backflow or anything to correct it? And how many K points or how large was the supercell? That's actually not so easy to do graphite, right? So I would question that the DMC is really converged here. Yes, I mean, it's, it's the finite size error is certainly the biggest error they have in there. So I said pseudopotentials, but 
uh, the error that you use in the simulation box is, um, or introduced by the truncation of the simulation box um, uh, by restricting yourself to a finite number of outcomes is significant, uh, especially for the small energy differences. And how many k points did you use? Um, so this, uh, uh, this was up to 444. Four, four. Uh, so quite that's quite a lot. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, then I thank you again very much. And in, in, the, to, in the sake of uh, finishing in time, uh, we will move on to our final speaker of the day.